Come on in, everybody. Make yourselves comfortable. It's all very exciting, MD Trans Awareness Day. So what we're going to do is just let the numbers build up while we wait here for a minute. And our, our technician is organising live streams and all sorts of other tech bits. And uh, we'll start it properly in, in, a, in a minute or two. I have my lovely stone. It's my D-Trans Awareness stone. It's beautiful. I was given it by... Uh, do you, did any of you read Alone in Berlin? It's a great book and these it's a true story about a couple in, in, in Nazi Germany. And I'm not saying it's the same. It's just a very interesting story. And they uh, brought postcards um, every single week. They'd go out and they'd put postcards around during the war saying Hitler is a maniac. Hitler is a, a madman. And they were just an ordinary couple. He was he was something like a plumber. He, was, he wasn't a plumber, but a welder or something. And every Sunday they went out and put postcards in the railway stations and the dentists. They put it everywhere for years. And the Nazis thought it was a big spy ring, but it was just an ordinary couple from Germany. Well, this is interesting because somebody I know is putting these little stones in. And it's for D-Trans Awareness Day and it's first do no harm and things like that. Wow. It's very beautiful. And the stones are very beautiful. Um, so I think we'll, we welcome everybody into the webinar. You're all very welcome. It's D-Trans Awareness Day and it's the GenSpec webinar about the WPATH files. Delighted to have Carrie, Dr. Carrie Mendoza and Mia Hughes. Maybe we'll first welcome you, Mia, and then Carrie, because Carrie is big news for us. So welcome, Mia. How has the first week of the WPATH files been for you? Make sure you unmute yourself. Yes, I'm unmuted. Uh, yeah, it's been really interesting. It's been um, a very exciting week. The reception has been largely positive from what I've seen. I think I've probably been tuning out the, the negative side of it mostly. But yeah, it's been, I've been doing lots of interviews. People are going to be sick of the sight of me very soon. I don't think we'll be sick of the sight of you. I think you're only starting. Just before we go any further, was it extraordinarily different to what you expected or had you did not know what to expect this first week of the WPATH files? I really had no idea what to expect. Before we before we launched, Michael did ask me, are you ready for this? And I, I really wasn't because I didn't, how could I possibly be ready? The, the coverage was great. The response has been great. It's been it far surpassed my expectations, if I had any expectations at all, but it was really difficult for me to imagine what it was going to be like. Yeah, well, it's very exciting. And then today, of course, the puberty blockers have been banned by the NHS. So we'll talk about a little bit about that later on. But the big focus today is D-Trans Awareness Day and the, the impact of the WPATH files on detransitioners and the impact of D-Trans Awareness Day on detransitioners and in many ways, the comp complex stories of the detransitioners. But before that, we'll invite in the lovely Dr. Carrie Mendoza, who I think is going to share with us some exciting news. Oh, thanks, Stella. And I'm uh, so glad to join our continuing webinar series. And, and thanks to the detransitioners, um, because, you know, we're all really working at all this to prevent, you know, medical, medical harm. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I left there and I'm going to be over in GenSpec. I'm going to, I'm going to basically run uh, GenSpec USA and uh, build that out, um, continue the momentum that, that Stella had already um, really some roots here in, in the States, but obviously we're at a super critical time with legislation, which I think with advocacy with um, all the different groups. And so it just made a lot of sense to join over with GenSpec so I can just continue to do all, all of these great things so we can end all of this. So so thank you. That's our that's our big news. And we'll have more to more to come. Um, uh, let, let me yeah. just comment. I think it's really imperative and so important, Dr. Carrie Mendoza has joined us because you know, GenSpec has become so large so fast, as everybody keeps on telling me, and we need we need more focused, you know what I mean? The idea of this big, huge, you know, international thing, we need it. So we've, we've got now a leader for GenSpec USA and on our way is our leader for 
just like Australia, New Zealand. And so it's it's going to be thankfully, it's 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 going to be a more managed space because we didn't expect to expand as fast as we did. And what I think it's very good. I think it's 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 very much a reflection of the demand for a more thoughtful approach to sex and gender. That's why we've expanded. I don't think in my wildest dreams did I expect Jespec to be a fraction as big as it is. And so therefore I can't emphasize how grateful I am that you've joined. I'm just absolutely thrilled. So the big event today is the Trans Awareness Day. It was first started and I see, you know, already questions have come in and you're very welcome to put Q&A in, questions into the Q&A and we will address them towards the end of the webinar. Um, last year, last week, the live stream was huge. It ended up being well over 2,000, I think 2,300 or 2,700 ended up watching in entirety. And uh, there were loads of Q questions. So we will address the questions this time. But somebody's asked, is the recording available from last week? It is. And not only that, my husband watched it and said, Mia, that you were fascinating. <laughs> He's my crit critic. And he came home and said, Mia was very, very interesting. So well done. Um, so I think I'll introduce the three detransition people that we have among us. May I start maybe with Laura? Could you tell us a little bit about yourself? What you know about Detrans Awareness Day? How much you think these type of things impact? Like I say, it started in 2020. 2020, as far as I know. 2021, I think. And then Genspec went very big with a webinar in 2022. And we went bigger again with another webinar in 2023. This time we did a whole range of art pieces and there was some animation, some interviews and some um, audio interviews and visual interviews and written interviews. So we've done a range of things. So, Laura, tell us about yourself. Hey, uh, yeah. So my name is Laura Becker. I detransitioned in 2019. So I kind of have been around for a while seeing before Genspect even existed before any of this was happening, before there was a day for T-Trans Awareness. So I've been participating uh, all three years and uh, I've seen it grow. And I've, you know, last year I did uh, in-person events. This year we're doing an even bigger in-person event in California. Um, so I'm just, you know, totally pleased to see the momentum of so many different groups of people coming together and most of all, I'm excited to see so many different detransitioners coming together and having camaraderie and, and making friendships. And, you know, none of it's forced, especially for me. I would never associate with people I didn't like uh, as I have a little reputation of doing. I think we all are kind of free thinkers. And that's kind of why we actually get into the gender stuff, even if some of us meander in through a cult because we thought we were being. Actually, we were like, oh, no, that's not that's not right. Uh, but once we get out of the cult, we're all kind of like, yeah, let's um, let's have a lot of passion. Let's have a lot of drive to to raise awareness. And obviously, I'm very into that. I have all my different uh, designs and things in my store that I've made. Um, and so, yeah, I, I like the lizard representation and I'm all about it. I love your sweatshirt. I, I stand with detransitioners. Yeah, I stand with detransitioners lizards and then first do no harm oh wow like very good is it not it's a salamander a rather than a lizard or have uh, we moved? i mean i don't know if there's i don't know what the difference have we transitioned um, salamander well i mean you know again like a lot of people ask me what does the lizard mean and you know um basically some lizards or salamanders i don't know the difference stella uh <laughs> so so that type of pressure here um <laughs> They, they can they lose their tails, like ends of their tails, whole chunks of their whole tails, almost sometimes. But some lizards have the uh, ability to regrow their tails. But when they regrow them, they end up a little funky, you know. They end up a little weird. And so the lizard symbol represents, um, you know, loss of body parts and then regrowth and rejuvenation, and then just moving on and healing after medical transition. Oh, that's beautiful. And before we go a little bit further, could you tell us, Laura, because people often want to know, like, how long were you in it mentally? How long were you in the trans thing mentally? You know, yeah. what kind of, you know, different interventions you get done and what pulled you out? Just a little bit around that. So people kind of because I know the audience will be wondering about that. What, what you know, and what pulled you out and 
how long have you been out, if you follow me? Because I think that really shapes, some people are only fresh out and some people are out for quite a long time. I know you said 2019, so just give a few of the details. Yeah, that's a long time in the world of gender, a very long time. It's, um, it's an A. So, <laughs> it's, it's an eternity. Um, so yeah, I just, um, you know, kind of started questioning my gender when I was 15 uh, and uh, came out as gender queer around 16, came out as a transgender gay man at 18, had uh, just took testosterone at 19, had my breasts removed at 20, and then I detransitioned at age 22, which was 2019. Uh, and I, the reason I kind of got out of it was because I wasn't helped by all the medicalization and my life had continued to actually get worse and I was devolving over time. And so by the time I was around 22, I was like, you know, I feel like there might be something else wrong that's, that's not being addressed. And so I did a series of all these psychological tests and IQ tests and autism and all these comprehensive exams psycho psychometrically. And I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. And that was from some childhood stuff, some attachment stuff, and then actually from the surgery and transition itself. So I actually developed more PTSD from the transition, which was trying to alleviate my distress. And so once I understood that I had PTSD, which I had never thought that someone like me would, would have PTSD, um, you know, things starting to click. And I realized that I was never a, a gay man or any type of man. I was just a traumatized girl, a traumatized autistic girl. And um, throughout the next six months or so, I found some very small secret uh, T trans women's groups on Facebook and was like, you're all traumatized women. So am I. And I've never felt like anyone understood that or I never related to anyone. And so I finally found my tribe of being some very traumatized autistic girls. Um, and yeah, since 2019, um, I'm now 27. So a lot, a lot's happened. And um, yeah, it's been a whirlwind of these years. But yeah, I'm very grateful now of where I am. Well, Laura, it's amazing. It's an amazing story. Um, I see a question you'll be very pleased to hear about your Etsy. Have you a shop or something? Laura, yeah, I so, hear the product, but not sure where she sells it. Okay, I didn't want to be too too forward. But yes, I do <laughs> sell goods. Um, and I would like people to buy them. Um, so Etsy actually canceled me last summer for having D-Trans Awareness shirts like this and for shirts and bags and things that said funky human female. And that kind of sparked a little boycott of Etsy. And so I have moved my shop away from Etsy to Shopify and you can... Find my store at funkypsyche.com. Good for you. Good for you. I think it's great that you do sell things and that you're kind of making your own kind of branding and shop. I think it's a great idea. And Carrie, do you see it? Stella. Yeah. It's a bit of capitalism but to see it. Yeah. <laughs> All for it. Um, um, somebody says here, I'm thrilled to see that Carrie will be taking over Genspect USA. Uh, leading and running and will this be posted on social media i would love to share yeah we're going to make a big announcement probably tomorrow but it's it's all in the all on the way there's all sorts of great campaigns carrie is already thinking of and i think it's going to be a really really exciting new chapter for the us with genspec I'm, I'm thrilled so um maybe um forrest would you like to introduce yourself and say a little about you about yourself where do we begin <laughs> again at the beginning maybe begin when you you know wh when did you first get into it what got you into it what got you out of it maybe what sort of interventions whatever whatever you feel comfortable that that goes back a long ways uh and that's something that i frequently explore is where to begin the story um because i can start it early in childhood or i can start it in um puberty Oh, no, start early. Give give the full. Take your time. We have plenty of time here. Why not? There's no way to start at the very beginning. Um, but there there were, I think that there were certain aspects of me psychologically and my temperament um, that made me susceptible, um, not only to what I got into eventually, but also, also to some sexualized bullying from older boys. Um, 
I was raised in a religious household and and some of that um philosophy I think affected my psychology too because I'm such a deep thinker um but it all pales in comparison to discovering um online erotica and that happened at the age of nine which would eventually lead to pornography and I, I make a distinction because there is a distinction between cartoons um and and writing and video pornography and that didn't come until I was 16. So there was five years of, of other erotica that was that was um, targeting me and certain aspects of my personality and preferences that were built in um, and driving me deeper. At the age of 12, I started cross-dressing. And so all of those things combined and built up for years um and on the on the outside and on the surface that was also starting to cause issues with my self-esteem with my peers the things that i would later refer to as gender dysphoria sometimes i look back and i i have even thought that it was kind of a fear of exposure that i would later refer to as gender dysphoria because it caused so much anxiety to have that relationship with myself um, and this is, you know, I've written about this recently. I've finished a chapter where I, I went right back to that first time when I started cross-dressing and I kind of uncoupled a just totally normal, like procreative urge. Um, but it got twisted up because of other issues um, that some of it came down to my home life. The fact that I felt like I had to keep it a secret um, and hold on to something and possess something. And then getting lost within myself, that um, that was underneath the surface. And already by the age of sixteen, uh, I remember the first time I was exposed to kind of queer theory and queer activism. It was actually ironically on like a church conference. Um, we had to go off campus to to uh, like a I was raised Mennonite, so it's Pink Menno, this education thing where they showed us LGBT. And they showed us like each one of those letters and told us what it meant. And they passed out these little, um, the different spectrums of your sex, your gender identity. I got the whole rap. And so by the, by the time I was in junior and senior year, I was already starting to, um, to advocate for that ideology myself. Um, and later on i would say it didn't help anything um so when i went to college all of those underlying issues kind of boiled over um the pornography and the cross-dressing caused so much anxiety and uh, self-esteem issues that i began abusing substances and alcohol and, and then turn affected my academic performance uh, and eventually i dropped out with this like kind of desire to transition i remember the drive home from university was this wild um trip where i didn't stop i drove from tennessee to oregon without stopping um and i drove through a crazy storm and in the middle of this blizzard a story came on npr about coming out and transitioning and how it was worth it and i heard that story on the radio and i was like i gotta do it i can do it um, so I came home and uh, fell in with the wrong crowd of other kids that I went to high school with who were very brilliant, also getting into non-binary and queer stuff and having unsafe sex and drugs and alcohol and dropping out. Um, and that was a crowd of people that would eventually peer pressure me into going to a gender clinic where I was diagnosed with gender dysphoria in a single visit. The clinic was called Transactive. Um, the clinician was a transgender woman. Um, and I was just, I was coached through what to say. I was told, we don't believe in gatekeeping here, but these are the things you're going to need to say in order to get this prescription. Um, so I, I started the hormonal therapy. I started the cross-sex hormones when I was 20 years old. And there was just no gatekeeping at the front. I saw an endocrinologist 
Um, it's, you know, I was really concerned about my fertility at the beginning. I kept bringing it up and I was told repeatedly that the hormones are reversible. When I went to a psychologist, a, I, I was going to a therapist and they also kind of encouraged me to, to deconstruct my thinking about adoption and what counts as a legitimate family. Um, so I, I had a pretty rocky start to the beginning of my transition. It was making things so much worse. It was making things worse with my family, with my friends. But whenever that would come up in therapy, that was blamed on societal transphobia. And the solution, I've looked at the notes, the solution was like to make the world less transphobic. Um, so things blew up in my hometown and I ended up moving to Portland. Uh, I got like laser hair removal and that helped me pass, you know? So it's, I had the hair on my face removed and I started doing my eyebrows. I went to Portland and there's just all of these social services geared towards LGBTQ youth um, where I was given free clothes, breast forms. There were trans and queer social workers encouraging me to change my name, my ID, everything. So my whole transition and livelihood ended up being supported by social services. I was housed through these groups. I was provided with friends, with vacation and, and other queer locations. Um, so I ended up transitioning. I, I began in 2015. So this was also kind of a first wave after the WPATH guidelines changed, I think in 2014, um, from 2015. And I, I transitioned for like four or five years in Portland. Um, I began meeting other trans women and trans feminine people. And I fell into a crowd where a lot of the men had had their testicles removed. And that was kind of sold to me because I didn't have any desire for genital surgery, but these other men were removing their testicles and then saying that this was like a healthier way to transition. They didn't really want the vaginoplasty. They weren't sure. They didn't want to commit to the binary, but if they remove their testicles, then they could feminize more easily. They didn't have to take the spironolactone and they could find some, I even found these out in the woods, um, in these kind of anarchist camps that I would stay at, there were older trans women that were creating their own estrogen therapy with like herbs. Um, and they were, they, they put the idea in my head of the orchiectomy, which is eventually what happened to me. Um, that was in June of, of 2020. Um, I had made some attempts at detransitioning right at the end. Um, and then just a lot happened. I aged out of the homeless youth continuum. I lost my housing. I was going through this this terrible smut spiral. There was meth involved. There was uh, an older man who was um, abusing me uh, and the hospital had me on their list and they got me. So I ended up having a, a breast implants inserted, covered on, on Medicaid and also an orchiectomy on Medicaid. And like within a month of the orchiectomy, I was suicidal with regret. I, I caught myself, um, I caught myself specifically the first time I experienced regret and I, I had to push away the drugs and the alcohol. Um, and I told myself at the same time, I, it's like, I regretted it, but I thought I don't regret it. I was still locked into the transgender ideology. And I believed that regret was part of being transgender. Um, so I regretted it as Jane Austen might say, I regretted it, but I didn't repent. I, I think she says things like that. I read Emma, but, uh, so I, I, um, I ended up catching COVID, which is what forced me to move back into my parents' house. And it just totally immobilized me. And that's what it took for it just to start falling away. And I, I woke up, the destruction of my testicles was just too much for the too much of the movement to ask of me. Um, I briefly was on Twitter. I found the Gender Wider Lens podcast, um, and that was part of what helped me. And, and a little bit of Twitter was good at helping unpack the ideology. And then I had to get off Twitter. I'm very glad I did that. I started to journal intensively. Um, and I had a, a just a wonderful discover like self-discovery finding my values um 
I I was just I'm so grateful I was able to reconnect with my grandmother and my grandfather in the last years before they died. Um, so I ended up being a caretaker for my grandmother um, before she passed away and, and my grandfather. I'm so grateful that I got to be with them. Um, and I journaled all the way through that, just having these kind of self-discoveries, the detransition itself, the unpacking the ideology. There was about a month or two, there's some very extreme grieving on when I also um, I, I, I no longer take the word PTSD and trauma so so lightly after having the bodily damage because I would I would wake up screaming remembering the surgery I'd wake up screaming no because I went into a surgery with a kind of awareness that I was going to regret it and so I, I would jump out of bed it, having flashbacks and I went through very extreme grieving it was really hard um, but I started testosterone replacement therapy in January of 2021. So the ORC in 2020, uh, January of 2021, it would be months before I could afford to get the breast implants out. Um, but by July of 2021, I was back in the workforce and I've been in the workforce. I've been caring for my family since, uh, it feels great. I've now been holding down a job. I'm a machine operator. In the in the cannery where my parents met, uh, my family has my mom's family because they're farmers. It's like I have a family connection to the place. I've been working there for two years now, um, and I'm getting involved in a community college for automotive technology, which just feels really good. It's it's rewarding. Um, I've been writing a lot, and recently I decided. You know, I feel like I'm in a place where I can come out and get involved a little bit more. I have a, a sub stack where I've written about these things that I'm processing. And I'm also working on a memoir where I can get a little bit deeper into the psychology um, of what led me to transition in the first place. So that's that's my story. I think you're muted, Stella. Thank you, yeah. Wow, Forrest, thank you very much for sharing that with us. It's a it's a shocking story. It's 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 shocking. It reminded me of the hero's journey. And it often does, the story of the detransitioners often does remind me of the hero's journey because I often think the people and I, I don't want to, you know, underestimate the pain of people who are lost in transition, but the courage it takes to say I, I shouldn't have done that. There's something extraordinarily brave to have the guts to say, I regret that. Well, and part of the hero's journey is that the hero comes home. I, I often think about that. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. Hey, Stella, so I just wanted to say, first of all, for us, it, I mean, all your stories are so, um, so you know, shocking. And just as a physician, again, it's just so disheartening to me to know that there's a faction of the medical industry that's just doing this so thoughtlessly. Um, and I, I just was in Arizona for 24 hours. I went um, to testify for a bill for basically to have um, require insurance for detransition in Arizona. And just what you said about how, you know, on the upside, like, hey, we have all these services, everything's free. But then when you want to detransition, you're totally on your own. And that is just not acceptable, obviously, um, and certainly factors into making it so difficult, you know, for, for, um, for you know, patients to get out of this. Because to figure out how to navigate that, how to pay for all those things... Um, so yeah, I, your story just highlights, I think everyone just how it's so important that we, we fix all this. So yeah, if, if the insurance companies are going to insure people's medical transition, they have to assure not only their detransition, but also any complications that might arise as a result of it, that will make the insurers sit up and listen. And it's going to be one of the campaigns Genspec USA is going to lead on. Yeah. Abel, would you like to take, um, some time to tell us um, your, you know, your story and your your thoughts and what made you get to where you are now. Sure. 
But before I start, I just wanted to say to what you and Carrie were saying, uh, apparently, according to uh, trans rights activists, uh, what me, Laura, and other detransitioners are going through is just part of our journey, gender journey. Right, Laura? Wait, you're, on, you're muted. Yeah. Yeah, but Abel, I mean, that's exactly why, you know, if it is, to use their language, part of our gender journey, then why should it not be covered, right? Because make we're it, uh, heretics. We have equity, right? We're, we're heretics. So we don't deserve yeah. rights. Well, exactly. We have wrong things. That means what, that we can't have medical care anymore. So, oh, right. And oh, I did before Abel jumped in. I mean, in my testimony, I mentioned that the gender journey, and it's mentioned in the WPATH files, which Mia knows that they recognize the quote unquote problem of, of detransitioners. It's increasing, and that it's better to talk about it as a journey. But as I said in my testimony, well, the whole journey needs to be covered and um, recognized. So, yes, but that that concept really is not, you know, appropriate in the sense that they're trying to put a euphemism there instead of calling what it really is. Sorry, go yeah. ahead. So I'd, I'd like to add to that because, you know, I, I did an interview with Kira Bell today. You know, I, I released it today and it's on Jesbex over there. And um, we were talking about the TikTokers and these are the younger generation than ye guys, if you follow me. And they are choosing, it's quite noticeable, a lot of Jensbeck members have kind of contacted us about it. They're choosing to say, I've stopped medical transition, I've stopped testosterone, I've stopped estrogen. But, you know, they're buying into the narrative, but it's just part of my gender journey. And, like, they're terrified. I'd imagine they're terrified to lo lose the, the, the community. And so they're choosing to stay in the community. And some of the influencers have done that too, you know, the likes of Noah Pencil and um, Jammy Dodger and stuff. They stopped and some of them go back on, but some of them stay stopped. And then they delete the kind of videos that they speak about because they're influencers. So there's an awful lot going on with this whole thing that isn't really I think next year that's going to be a big part of what we're talking about is it's going to be that but let's hear from Abel for a first one and just for anybody yet yeah, we will be addressing the questions we're going to give time to address the questions later on but first of all we'll speak to Abel and Mia um after that all right well now it's my turn welcome chat uh, my name is Abel Garcia I am one of the detransitioners on today's panel and for my story um, I guess I'll start from the beginning, from when I was a child. So, my parents uh, came to the United States illegally from Mexico. And due to that, obviously, I did not spend good time with my, quality time with my parents growing up as a child. As my, both of my parents were forced to work very long hours and not spend much time with me. So they can make enough to, for us to survive. Now, again, I come from a Mexican background, and my culture is very, very masculine. Sure. And I have always been a very soft-spoken young kid, not stereotypically masculine. Right. And so I didn't really bond well with my own father growing up. Doesn't help again that he was absent, working 24-7. And I would say that's where my confusion started. That and that as as a young boy, I questioned myself if I was good enough to be a boy and to eventually be a man. And for some reason, my mind said no. Well, fast forward uh, to I want to say late middle school, early high school. Uh, I finally got access to the internet, and of course, we all know the internet's always the main culprit for all this. Uh, YouTube is what introduced me to what transgender was. Don't remember how I found it, but uh, this was over a decade ago, so oof, I feel old now. <laughs> um, so, because again, I was confused as a young kid. This made some sense to me at the time. And then I didn't make any progress in regarding my transition until after I was out of high school and into college. I didn't really have anything to do in life. So, I guess... Yep. So, I had to ask myself, what do I want to do with my life? 
who am I? And I was eventually referred to a LGBT center where they had their own therapist. Well, on that first appointment with this therapist, who was a lesbian woman and also ran the transgender support group, told me uh, on my first appointment with her that, yes, I am a transgender woman. She had my letter to transition right away, and she did not want to gatekeep me. Now, part of my story has to also involve religion. Uh, so again, being uh, Hispanic, Latino, Mexican, however y'all want to call it. Um, it's very religious, very Catholic, and I want to say part of the reason why I was able to dodge a lot of the major bullets was this, that... Spiritually speaking, I uh, God spoke to me right before I went to see this therapist. And I say that because someone, I heard a voice and it said, if I'm going to go through this, I, they can't stop me. So I have to wait five years before breast implants and 10 years before vaginal plasty. Uh, there was no one else in that office. Uh, so I have, again, I have to assume it was God. So again, I went to see the therapist. Uh, she was so ready to fast track me. I told her I wanted to take things slow, as I wasn't sure. Well, unfortunately, my father caught wind of what I was doing, and his best solution at the time was to force me to have sexual relationships with a prostitute in a foreign country against my will. Uh, I don't remember much, uh, as I have chosen to block that memory. But I eventually learned that was the catalyst that w made me want to finally transition as I was sexually assaulted and had trauma dealt onto me. Uh, eventually, I did accept those hormones. I accepted the letter to transition. And I eventually started to socially transition in November 2016. Less than a year later into my transition, another medical professional spoke with me and said they had my letter for surgery for both breast implants and a vaginoplasty. Now, going back to that promise I made with God, I broke the first rule and I got the implants, but I agreed and kept the second rule of not getting vaginoplasty for at least 10 years. Looking back, that was the best idea, uh, as I've now regretted everything that I've done. Uh, but I know when I spoke to this medical professional, I said, I don't want the vaginoplasty. Um, I'll get the breast implants for now, but I definitely want to take things definitely slowly. Again, they don't care. It's a conveyor belt from start to finish. I got everything approved right away. Well, eventually I got the implants. Uh, my time within the transgender community was speaking from the past, hindsight being 2020. It was a break. I had finally what I, I got what I wanted, friends, attention, and felt supported. But unfortunately, everything came crashing down when I committed a great sin to them. And that sin was trying to become a police officer while being transgender. I know it sounds insane to hear, but that is unfortunately what happened. So eventually they kicked me out of the transgender community. They blacklisted my name completely from the entire LGBT community. And that was around the same time I got the implants. So everything had finally started to crash down upon me. But could and... I ask, why, why did they have an issue with you? Being a, was it the LGBT community had an issue with you becoming a? Is this some sort of anarchist thing or something? I'm gonna be honest. I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised. But this was in Southern California. So, well, I wish I had a better answer than that. But back to my story. Um, so after they kicked me out, blacklisted me, um, and I had just. Re started recovering from breast implant surgery the realization of what I was doing hit me like a truck 
uh, one day I started asking myself, what the heck am I doing? Made the realization that even if I got every surgery, every took hormones for the rest of my life and appeared as feminine as humanly possible, in the end it wouldn't have mattered because I made the realization I was always going to be a man. And that made me start to think, I made a mistake and how can I reflect, reverse all this? I went back to my therapist who approved me for everything and her immediate response was, you're not wrong, you haven't made any mistakes, you just had surgery, you're still recovering, and you have underlying childhood traumas. Uh, my question is, why the hell are you saying that part now? Why was that not brought up in the beginning? I never got a response from her, I stopped seeing her after that. Went to see a new therapist, and again, same thing. It, this was a gay man, had an agenda, would not let me detransition. And even though I tried to weasel my way out by trying to join the U.S. military, because at the time, it was you could not enlist if you were transgender. So I was trying to find any way to, again, weasel my way out of my transition. He didn't buy that. So I still continues. By this time, I'm losing hope in everything. And unfortunately, I get into alcohol abuse. So I lost about a year, I want to say, of my life in drinking. A decent amount. Uh, and then eventually, I got lucky and I found the story of an older detransitioner. And after some hesitation, I eventually reached out to him. Explained to him what was going on, and he referred me to a friend of his who lived in and worked in the area that I lived in. Explained to him what the situation was, and he eventually decided to help me. Even though in the state of California, what he was doing is illegal, as that is considered a conversion therapy. Well, eventually, I got everything approved after, even though I had to fight my insurance, as they did not want to cover anything. And the implants were eventually removed in 2020. My chest was reconstructed in 2022. And I started speaking out in January of 2020 about my experiences in, regarding transition, detransition. And it's been a roller coaster since then. I just ask, when did you start speaking out? January 20. 20. 20. Okay. And you got your implants out somewhere. Removed, uh, December yeah. of 2020. I, I think it's really important. Thank you very much. It's it's a harrowing story you, you've just shared with us, a shocking story. It's very important that people realize it's a process. It's a long process, the detransition, the transition process or the detransition. It's layer upon layer of understanding of, of what has happened. And before we go any further, we will go back to 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 all all of you, Laura, Forrest, and Abel. But um, Mia, I'd love if you would come in and speak a little about the W Path files and how they might make a difference to the D-Trans experience, and certainly give some understanding to what is going on with those clinicians' heads or those W Path clinicians around detransition, or what is your you you've studied them, so you've studied this for some time. What's your thoughts around the, the, the W path vibe around it? Well, I can tell you that the the form that the detransition section is in in the report right now is not what it looked like the first draft. On the first draft, I was just livid and basically just spitting fire. I was so angry. It was such an angry section because it's the part that enraged me the most the way they talk about detransition so especially because you know that these are the very people who endlessly campaigned to remove all the guardrails gatekeeping is transphobic so they did away with all the protections they advocate for the most vulnerable people in society to be placed onto this reckless experimental medical conveyor belt and then they do no follow-up to see what became of them. This is the very people. And then in the files, you see them talking about detransitioners, just 
trivializing the experience, downplaying it, blaming the victim. I mean, I don't know who saw Richie on GB News the other day when Andrew Doyle read out um, a couple of comments from um, the files and Richie had the right response, to be honest. Like the, it was a it was colorful language and it was the right response. Um, so they will say things like, you know, detransitioners have to own and take responsibility for their decisions, especially if it's a permanent medical decision, completely oblivious to the fact that the blame lies entirely 100% on the doctors and the WPATH members who have done this to these vulnerable people. They will say things like, you know, we need to frame D well we've talked about the gender journey we need to frame detransition as another step on the gender journey and one of them in there you know and they're all little activists as well there's marcy bowers is in there he's the one who says you have to take responsibility but then there's a whole bunch of little activists in there saying we've got to find a way to um allow people to make the decisions that they want to make but recognizing that gender is ever shifting and whatever and it's like you you're trying to do the impossible you can't do that you can't allow people to permanently alter their bodies while at the same time recognizing that gender is is changeable and in and, and in a state of flux this is simply impossible and they've lost complete sight. Well, they I don't think they can possibly see the harm. They see themselves as being saving lives on the right track. They're on the right side of history. And they just, they have to, because detransitioners create such cognitive dissonance, they absolutely have to deny, deny that it, it happens. But when they come face to face with the fact that it does happen, they downplay it and trivialize it. It makes me absolutely livid yeah me too it's horrifying horrifying the way they gaslight detransitioners who have literally been targets of malpractice yeah. and you know do you want to come in carrie and then i'll yeah. invite in each each of the yeah. lowers to start off with but first yeah of for sure for sure i was just thought it was a good time to to um recall our experience at the American Academy of Pediatrics booth and uh because Abel and you know Laura were were with me and most of the pediatricians just were so welcoming and really wanted to learn and and that was fantastic but we did have a few that th that was the reaction they were really yelling at the detransitioners quite you know like blaming the victim, you know, saying it was because, you know, of them, trans people now can't get health care. And, you know, how how devastating to to say that to a, a you know, a, a, a young person who has been harmed by this. Um, so unfortunately, yeah, it it's that it is just really I, as a doctor, I've just never seen any other medical people blame a victim of of medical harm. Yeah, I don't know, Abel or Laura, if you want to share, you know, some of our experiences there and what that was like. Maybe Laura first, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, oh, man, there was just so many, and there continues to be so many things from the American Academy of Pediatrics conference alone um, that uh, several of us were at. I mean, you know, generally people were were afraid to speak to us. Um, and as soon as they heard the word detransition, they had probably some very scary, you know, right wing connection or of what that might mean. And so they were very afraid to speak to us. They tried to like run away as quick as they could a lot of the time. Um, and then there was a few people who were hostile and uh I've just seen yesterday some some emails that were released internally from a the AAP where members were were doctors were it was all doctors at this conference. So it was doctors um saying that they were worried about safety issues because there was detransitioners at their conference. And so that 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 angered me greatly. Um because, you know, I mean it's just a group of 
of young people, basically in their 20s, <clears throat> you know, talking about their medical trauma and trying to get people to care at all, like doctors that are supposed to be interested in this, like intellectually curious where they weren't, at least they wouldn't admit it. Um, and then there was some leaked audio of of a private, uh, not private, but you had to pay to get into it. And um, a friend sent us that audio and it was revealing all this really gruesome indoctrinating guidance of what members of the AAP are being taught. I mean, about gender ideology, about what transgender is. And there was terms like chesticles and all these euphemisms for you know, just normal body parts that we wouldn't have seen in medicine. You know, it's, I feel like it's a real influence of fetishists online, like porn sick individuals who seep into these organizations, get a status of power, and then start rewriting everything that we know about biology. Um, and the AAP did uh, get that video removed from my YouTube channel. And, you know, they, They've come after people. They've come after actually the the person who sent that audio was mysteriously released from employment. Um, and so just from that conference alone, there's been a lot of people that are doctors. Again, I want to reiterate, these, these are doctors. These aren't just like everyday people. These are doctors who have extensive study and training and who have an oath of ethics, um, who are in a position of authority over vulnerable patients and their families that are saying that they're afraid and fearful of hate and bigotry just because detransitioners are just sitting at a table talking about what happened to them. Well, Laura, if I may add, we all know why they're scared because we're shining the light on their lies and they can no longer make a penny off of us. Right, they are afraid of lawsuits, absolutely. I think they might also be afraid of the fact that they would have to confront the fact that they've done great harm and they're in a position of responsibility and they're getting salaries to to protect the health of their patients and to be confronted with the fact that your work is causing harm. It's fairly powerful. Before we go on to Abel, um, Laura, what was your, how did the WPATH files impact you when you when you, you know, read them and listened about them and things like that? I mean, I was in great anticipation of the WPATH files for months. I was kind of was following it as soon as I heard about it. And, um, you know, Michael, shall, you know, Michael wouldn't tell me anything. You know, there's all, all this like mystery around it and just like, wow, this is going to be big. Um, and so when it was finally released, I got so many text messages and it was just like a it felt like we were all together in like a little town square and there's someone ringing a bell and being like, here ye, hear ye. Like there's some jacked up shit that's going down. Um, and sure enough, there was many jacked up shits that were going down um, in those files. And I mean, it, you know, again, like as much as I kind of can, I, I do a lot of coping via intellectualization, if people couldn't tell that, and humor. But when I'm confronted with that and when I'm conf confronted with the stories of, of my peers and with other people, it's a lot easier for me to empathize with my past self. And, you know, I felt like I did feel like crying. I was pretty distracted at an event. So luckily I was at, had around like a lot of support, but I did feel very emotional and, and very hurt and my heart hurt just thinking about the horrific injustice that was done to these patients that are just so confused and naive. Um, and so I was, you know, just like everyone, I was very, I was heartbroken over it. And, but I was also, you know, felt very triumphant. And there's a kind of a vindictive feeling like, you know what? It's about time. And I have no sympathy for, like, as time goes by, I have less and less sympathy for the cultists who, like, it's one thing to be indoctrinated in, in the cult and, and inadvertently harming yourself. It's another thing to be kind of a flying monkey for, like, a narcissist in the cult or to be a narcissist in the cult that's indoctrinating other people to do it and encouraging other people to also harm themselves to validate their own identity. Um, and so I just have a level of disgust at 
you know, the doctors involved and the dismissal and the gaslighting. And again, it just lights more fuel under me that I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to stop doing what I'm doing anytime soon. Good for you, Laura. Good for you. Very well said. And um, Abel, how did you feel when you um, uh, he first heard about the WPATH files or have you read much about them? Um, I read... I failed to do my homework before here, so Carrie, please don't get upset. I didn't do my homework. <laughs> we forgive you. Uh, yeah. I, uh, but from what I've seen, I'm not surprised, and I was given very little time ahead of time before they went public. But because of what I've been through, what I know about what Laura's gone through and other detransitioners have gone through personally, I, I was, my expectations were very lo low regarding what they were going to say, because I knew, as Laura said, we were all going to be vindicted on what we've always been saying. So, I hate you. Not surprised, to be honest. I know. There's, you know, there's a core who, 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 who and may, I'd love to know how many of them, I wonder, is it about 5,000 people who know a lot, who know everything. And then there's the rest of the world. And the big thing, the big task of the WPATH files is to reach beyond the 5,000 into the normies, into the general public to say this is going on because our ability to get it beyond our echo chamber has has been quite limited. Forrest, I'd love to hear your thoughts on everything that we've been talking about. Yeah, I um, I did read the WPATH files and I and I watched the, the video. I also watched your guys's um, live stream and so it was interesting to go from that to actually watching the the talk itself it was very strange because you see a group of people having a conversation and it's it's kind of seemingly reasonable I, there's something you guys said in the live stream about how are they going to react to this and they're going to go business as usual and it was it was almost daunting to see that because you're almost going, what's the problem? They they all seem level headed. But what it came down to was when you for one thing, the discrepancy between what they're saying in those conversations about these kids, they you know, they really can't consent to what they put out there. And that was the um the hypocrisy there, the the doing one thing and then saying another in these private groups it takes a critical eye to see that and um it's all you know it's it is daunting it is daunting to to witness how ingrained um all of this is it's been so normalized that they can they can really fall back on that and i watch these little um tricks of logic they do about detransitioners the one that that got me i felt offended for they read the case of a 15 year old boy who starts on spironolactone because overnight he, he comes out to his parents and says oh i'm the girl you know and he he does a little bit of the hormones and later they go that's the right thing to do spironolactone is a nice drug and you go a nice drug i just you know i'm like wow these are I won't even get into that the, the over medicalization um is just so it's so excessive but the kid ends up coming out of it in a few months and says, oh, I'm a boy that likes to paint my nails. And then the response of one of the clinicians is he goes, some kids are brighter than others. And some kids get just get it. And there's a difference between being transgender and being a cross-dresser. And it's said with this tone of contempt. And I, you know, it honestly, as somebody who went through the whole thing, it's still, I think that's what, I mean, that's what they'll say about anybody who comes out of it. And that's part of the fear of detransitioning is you no longer have this oh, wow. armor and this disguise, at least from my standpoint, from the male standpoint, you no longer have this like, well, this isn't a weird sexual fetish. Oh, you, no, you're invincible. It's not, I mean, you're pure. You're a pure gendered soul and you're actually a victim of, of everything. And uh, somebody who is doing it as a fetish, pfft, they're actually, you know, um, offending the pure transgender soul, and it's, um, it's, it's, it is. I mean, I felt on the one hand, I, I don't, I don't want to say I felt daunted because I'm, I'm clearly not daunted, but I looked at it and I'm like, that's quite a, a complex, to tango with, 
Um, and then I dove deeper into my writing and just like going down into my own, uh, the root of all, all of my identity because, um, you know, my gender journey began with cross-dressing when I was 12 and it developed into a, a very, um, like a very outspoken, successful, seemingly transition. And nobody would have, would have dared to suggest that about me when I was in my transgender identity. And I had a kind of a similar attitude towards cross-dressers. You know, people I perceived as being cross-dressers, just being different from me. I was transgender and they were um, less than. So I, it just, it's a huge irony because you're actually looking at a group of like cross-dressers. They're almost all of them were trans, were transgender and were presenting as the opposite sex. And they're like making fun of a 15 year old boy for realizing that, you know, he just was interested in playing in, in like a girl costume for a little bit. And yeah, I, I think when you see a, like a, an adult person like that mocking a 15 year old boy or girl who's a little bit special, it's, um, it, it is contemptible. It's despicable. So I would say that's how I, that's how I felt watching it. It was, it was what a head case. There's a lot of work to be done. Good for you. You really nailed it with those words. You really did. Contentable and despicable. Yeah. You're right. It was awful. And we do have, we have so much more to say and maybe we'll have other webinars in the future around that whole point you made about cross-dressing and, you know, the transgender pure soul. There is so much to unpack in that. We will be getting to the q and A. I I know we'll be shot if we don't. Mia, would you like to comment on what, what Forrest just said? Because I can see you're very engaged. Don't forget you're muted. Should... It's, there, it is, there is that thing where there's something about when you watch the video and they are exactly what he said, what Forrest said, that they seem like normal people. They seem, they seem like good people when you listen to them talk and and they you know you kind of with what they're saying you you almost expect horns to start growing out of their their foreheads or something because they're just saying such horrendous things such and you know that the whole ideology that they are pr promoting is so evil and causing so much harm that it can be very jarring to hear them speak it's easier when you read their words you can well i don't know if it's easier actually but it does seem much more evil on a page mm -hmm. but when you hear these people speaking and they just seem like good people and i've talked about this and i get in trouble for this because i think strictly they are good people in that they're not evil people setting out to cause harm they're good people committing terrible acts of evil because they think they're helping. And that's actually what makes them far more dangerous because it's far more difficult to spot a good person committing a terrible act of evil. If someone's just evil and committing an evil act, nobody supports that. So no, it's, it's utterly despicable. The case study that you talked about, Forrest, horrendous. I remember that one, just awful. And yeah, they just, they're, they're true believers. That's the problem. There is a difference in their mind to the transgender person and the cross-dresser because they're true believers. But I did, like Ben Ryan, I don't know if you read Ben Ryan's piece today. It was great. Yeah. And I think he may have said, I think he got a quote from Edward Sleeper, maybe someone on the inside of WPATH, that apparently these panelists are viewed internally as heroes that everything that they were talking about in that panel session was they were just trying to, they were talking about difficult cases and they were trying to find the best way to help the patients. Everyone on the inside is sort of, they think they're heroes. They think that there, that was a great panel discussion and that we're just awful people for suggesting that, that it was, that it was not, not so good. Wow. Um, you know, the banality of evil, it's been written about by Hannah Arendt, and it's, it's, it's so appropriate, I think, for for what is going on. And it's so chilling because you can realize this can be applied in so many different and will be. And it's going to happen again and again and again. And I always go back to 
if we can create culture of upstanders where, where people just do not stand by and people speak up, you know, and, and say this isn't good enough. I'm going to go to some of the questions because so many people have uh, asked questions. I'm delighted to report this around 600 people on the in the Twitter space and then there's more over on the YouTube live stream. So we're, we're, we're spreading far and, and wide and spreading the word of D-Trans Awareness Day. Don't forget, we've already been trending today. D-Trans Awareness Day has already been trending today. Trill, to report. Hey, Stella, uh, while, you're, while you're looking, yeah. can I just, just say one quick thing? Because, you know, Abel and, and Laura were, you know, with with me at the American Academy of Pediatrics and and they were so brave and, and comported themselves so so professionally and so well for people who've been hurt um and did such a good a good job and when you're talking about the banality of evil and institutions that are broken that that are really super highways for all this because if a response is well wow you you victims here or or people coming to try and talk and educate about this and build bridges um that you know it's upside down as as that the detransitioners um, are the problem and doctors trying to build bridges and talk are the problem versus um, these institutions that are kind of allowing this continuation of quieting down, you know, squashing conversation and gaslighting people. So but I just want to make sure to acknowledge Abel and Laura um, are really, really brave and did a great job. And I know Camille, I saw I has a question, has a question there and she, she also was just so lovely um, and um, took, you know, uh, a, a, a brunt of, uh, you know, a, an angry, inappropriate, you know, physician yelling at her. Um, so I just wanted to make sure everyone recognizes how brave they've been. I wanted to get uh, Camille to speak. I'm just trying to look for her name there um, because um, I know she raised her hand and I'd be delighted if she spoke. I know um, maybe I know we wanted her to yeah come on. Maybe yeah. we'll... it's just been such a busy week. I didn't yeah. get together to invite her early enough. But um, Camille, if you're here, um, I know you were here. Raise your hand again, and I'll 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 do the tech that's needed to to ask to to speak. Some of the questions uh, that have come up so far while we're waiting for that is um, one person has said, um, thank you for us for sharing. How have you addressed your parents' journey? I understand that you were captured by this, but I'm wondering how did your parents move on and how did your parents experience the whole thing? If you want to share, don't feel you have to. It's very much your own story. Well, you know, I, I don't know how much to get into my into about my parents um but i can say on behalf of my on behalf of my my mom um it was it was obviously hard on her um and and she was going through i think the the grief that many parents go through um and unfortunately the the church community that we came from is very liberal, very progressive, and also Mennonite, which is a religion known for shunning. Um, so she was treated very poorly by her by her church community, um, and I, I would say that's as much as I have to say for their own journeys. Um, I'm now working on my relationships with with both of my parents, um, but that it's almost unrelated to gender just kind of a human human and growing up story at this point um but the one thing that i can say uniquely about about my parents going through this is i i do understand now more and more what parents face with having the kid who is transitioning when they know that it's wrong and they know that it's going to be a mistake and everybody around them is gaslighting them and making them feel like they're a, a terrible transphobic person because that's what my mom went through and um you know i don't think that she deserved that well good for you i think i think most of us when we're starting to come to maturity we start to understand our parents position and the impossibility of being a parent and we, we you know we you know we all try our, our best in our own fallible way i think the parents have had an extraordinarily difficult 
awful poison chalice of not knowing which to do with with the the, the you know the trans identified kid. Somebody has come in to say it needs to be D-Trans Awareness Week starting in 2024. But kind of is. I think uh, Laura's going to something. What are you going to in a couple of days? Laura, t- tell us about it. Yeah, so tomorrow I'm flying to Sacramento, California to speak at the capital of the state. Uh, we're going to do a press conference and a rally. There was one last year. This is going to be even bigger. Abel's also going to be there. So just a good group of detransitioners and parents, and we're going to be promoting the California ballot initiatives, which is, you know, we're really trying to set a precedent in California, one of the most crazy um, states to kind of protect children. Yeah, they're probably the most crazy, Um, but there's great momentum on it. And so, I mean, yeah, at this point, I pretty much consider Mars to be kind of like detrans awareness (laughs) bundle, just because there's so much, there's always just so much going on. Um, you know, it's kind of evergreen in a way. Good for you, great. Or if if they can have a a month, a week, a, a day, and a few other things, I think Birmingham we can get a month, right? Oh. I mean, we've just said that it's a month. We don't have to do anything formal to do that. Yeah, well, just, you know what? I, I've declared it. Next year. Well, okay. I think it's Laura year. declared it. I declared it. <laughs> Detroit Witness <laughs> Month. Get the shirts and the hats all month. Okay, I think probably part. we can profit off of that pretty well. And we'll see. Um, still, um, if you don't mind, I actually didn't get to answer Carrie's comments earlier regarding the AAP from my perspective. Please, you do. might answer that real quick. Good point. Um, so my perspective act- uh, on the AAP is actually a bit different from everyone else, and I say that because Carrie was working me pretty hard. I got no breaks. <laughs> Um, and I say that because I able. <laughs> oh, there are so many. Be... There were so many Spanish-speaking doctors. Everybody that, that was one of the things. There were a lot of Spanish-speaking doctors, and we're like, Abel, we need you over here to talk to the Spanish speak the Spanish speakers. So you were busy. Yeah, I, I, I was not allowed to take any breaks, but all the young ladies were able to take at least fifty breaks a day, and I was stuck in the booth. <laughs> <laughs> the, the best I got was like a two minute lunch break, and then I was back to work. Well, we had so many people that wanted to talk with us, and and so we were busy. But there were quite a few Spanish Spanish speakers. Yeah, um, I did have a lot of people from all over Latin America, Mexico, yeah. Colombia, Argentina, El Salvador, Peru. I uh, just to name a few, and I. A lot of them were not really too well informed on the transgenderism now that here in the U.S. and the U.K. are aware of. Yeah, I mean, they were very shocked at what was going on. Out of everyone that I interacted with, there was only one person that I got the hint that they supported it. And then I also did have a young man who I was identifying as a woman uh, be upset with me speaking to his father about what happened to me or why we were there. Apparently, he was so upset that uh, when he actually yelled at his father, it was either him or me in regards to who he, his the dad should have talked to. And the dad told him he's allowed to talk to whoever he wants. Son got upset, walked away, came back a few minutes later, told his dad it was time to go, tried to explain to the kid what we were doing, offered, tried to be polite and peaceful, and, well, he didn't like that. Still called me an asshole, a far right wing, and a lot of other things. And in the end, he walked away flipping me off the bird and then sending me a nasty DM. Oh. Well, you you guys were, uh, again, uh, calm and uh, just educating. And uh, it, it's one of the great successes of uh, last year because we really really talked with a lot of, a lot of people to raise awareness about what this medical scandal and what's happened happened to you all so which is day trans awareness day and week and month so and what, year, what about the trans year yeah yeah me or am too. i pushing my luck <laughs> yeah i think there's going to be what i would love is people got gained recognition of the complexity of the trans yeah people realized the androgynous nature of some people who've detransitioned 
and that we need as a society to, to accept that there has been a wave of people who've been medically tra transitioned when they were vulnerable and now they are left dealing with an androgynous ex appearance. Um, some people have, but some people haven't, but it's definitely an issue. And that's a, that's a very, very complex thing to, to deal with. And I don't think society has ever been asked to deal with that. And I think it's something that has to come up. There's two points I want to read out. One is somebody said, have you any, because we've just been talking about the AAP, so it seems relevant. Have you any insight about how to discuss this topic with people who may not have heard anything about it? I find that people think I'm insane or too right wing when I express concerns about this. I'd like to ask the detransitioners because I kind of think, surely you've got a Trump card. Surely you've got a kind of, I've been there. I'll tell you, sit down and I'll tell you about it. But tell me, well, go on, Laura, you tell me. Yeah. So, you know what? I'm traveling a lot these days and I'll often, you know, encounter, you know, a lot of like Uber drivers and just oh, random yeah. staff, you know, just kind of everyday people. And, you know, they just ask me why I'm in town. So basically what I always say to someone who knows pretty much nothing is I say that I'm in town to do a medical ethics event uh, or speaking on medical ethics <laughs> and be like, oh, what medical ethics, you know, and I'll say, you know, it's about mental health and um, medical ethics around gender and around uh, gender dysphoria. And they'll be like, and, and I'll be honest, like more often than not, the everyday people are like, you know what, I've been seeing a lot about that. And I've been kind of having my suspicions, like, what do you think? And I'll be like, well, I'm actually a detransitioner. So I actually identified as transgender, did these surgeries and hormones, and then realized it was unhealthy. So now I, you know, speak out and I write about, you know, the harm that it caused and kind of there's a lack of proper medicine being done and there's a lack of mental health treatment being done. So that's how I pretty much talk about it to someone who knows nothing. Um, and I would say like pretty much like 99% of the time it's gone really well and they end up agreeing with me and they ask me if I and I'll link them to a documentary or event or something to learn more. Wow, good for you. Good for you. What about Forrest or Abel? Do you do you confront it? You take it on or speak about it? Uh, well, uh, regarding to the part of being insane, I think we're all insane in the membrane for one. Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> and even though we there are so many people on the left and on the right who agree on this, uh, we are all automatically far right wing individuals who hate innocent trans people, according to those who are pushing this ideology. But jokes aside, uh, I do try to have conversations with people when I used to travel. I haven't traveled in. Technically, tomorrow's going to be my first time traveling in, I want to say, almost a year. Would you say that's accurate, Laura? Almost a year now? Yeah, almost a year. Without counting DC. Yeah. And, uh, that's right. Yeah, so I'm excited how it's going to go or in, tomorrow and Thursday. But uh, I usually try to go around the same route with Laura, uh, but a bit more blunt, I guess. But arguably, arguably, different ways, different ways. But let's say Laura's well able to say it straight too. I wonder, um, Forrest, how do you say things? Um, do, do you bring it up? Because sometimes when I'm tired and somebody brings up, like, what are you doing? Sometimes I, to get the energy to say it all can sometimes be. I'm still figuring that out. I'm still figuring that out. There's different realms of, of a person's life. There's yeah, you know, intimacy. I, I had a relationship where I didn't tell some. I'm, you know, there was a part of my detransition where I would just blurt it out. And then recently I challenged myself to not, to, you know, I don't, for me, because I went through this, um, to come out and say that that's my past, uh, it kind of threatens to define me and I don't want it to define me. So, um, I am still figuring that out. And in terms of politics, I'm also challenging myself to kind of a vow of non-politics and not making political commentary that's been an issue um for like at least three generations of men in my family so i'm i gotta kind of rise above that and not make political commentary um 
find some other way of being in the world that is not uh, politically charged. But it is extremely frustrating that this one issue gets you like pinged uh, as being right wing. And it, it, it's, it's just, it's so frustrating at this point. I feel like if I make any criticism of something that is being said um, politically here by even like NPR, um, I'm suddenly it could, coming across as right wing to somebody who's um, indoctrinated in that. So I, I'm still figuring it out. Well, even, I, even in my intimate life, I'm figuring out the boundaries of how much to share about all this. I, I really try uh, personally the answer that I found again and again, and this is just me, is, um, and I, I, a part of me even hates to say it because I, I see some trans rights activists be like, well, they need to tell their story, but they shouldn't be political. And I think that that's garbage. Um, I'm, but that's what I'm doing. And I'm not doing it because they said so. I'm doing so because. But because of the issues, you know, uh, in in my personal life, I uh, come from like a line of men who get a little bit too political and antagonistic. So I, I can't do that. That's my personal vow. I focus on my own story. Um, but because I went through this personally, that could be seen as, as a political act. Uh, and I just try to go to lengths to tell my own story in the full kind of uh, um, range that it was. Uh, and, and I avoid, I try to avoid making general statements, um, but at the same time, you kind of have to. So I, I don't know, I'm figuring it out. That was a long-winded answer. Uh, thank you. I'm glad you said you're figuring it out because especially in this world of social media, everybody's asked to take a position mm -hmm. and to be sure of their position. And I think if more of us were saying, I'm not sure, and I'm staying in my not sure until I want as far as long as I want to. But about the political thing, Jensbeck kind of prides itself and welcome all political colours. Um, and it's it's a very important aspect of Jensbeck that we're, we're just not going to be pigeonholed one way or the other. Everybody's got their, their voice and everybody. So long as you've got accurate information and you're thoughtful, that's enough. Um, one person said something, and I saw Carrie, you'd like to answer it, and I'd love other people to to kind of come in on this. I feel like I manipulated my therapist into giving me a diagnosis so that I could transition. What advice can you give to someone who really believed they wanted it at the time? So Carrie, um, you, or would you want to go first? Oh, sorry, Carrie can go first. Yeah, that's fine. Well, no, I, w I was going to comment more after what Forrest said, but you guys go ahead and answer that because th those are, I think, super important questions. I want to hear more from you guys. So, you know, I've, so I've had a lot of um, like interpersonal abuse and manipulation in my life and my family and my intimate relationships. So I've had to study the, you know, abuse dynamics and gaslighting and all these things on an extremely personal level that honestly is a lot more hurtful than transgenderism would ever be to me. But I've been able to learn, study, and then extrapolate that to the broader, you know, cultural dynamics and other types of relationship dynamics, such as between a patient and a doctor. And so I see this repeatedly, you know, with all types of survivors, um, you know, whether it be a domestic violence survivor or a detransitioner who's surviving, um, you know, gender medicine, that there's going to be a feeling of shame and there's going to be a feeling of, you know, bargaining and, and, and just the horror at realizing that you made a mistake and blaming yourself and detransitioners don't tend to be the most healthy people going into transition. So they tend to have, you know, some amount of conditioning that already they had really negative thoughts and, and an internal critic that was really mean to them and saying it's all your fault and you deserve this and you ruin everything in people's lives, you know, all those types of things. So when you detransition, of course, you're going to still have that and it's going to be even more elevated, which is why, it, you know, at first detransitioning, the first like six months or so are so difficult. Um, and so I would say I really empathize with anyone who's saying that they feel like they manipulated, you know, their doctor or therapist and... Um, I'm not saying that 
you know, there's not a some level of responsibility because uh, I mean, sometimes, you know, um, the peer contagion teaches people to trans identified people to, to lie and use a script and, you know, do those things. So I don't know if that was this person's situation, but most of what I've seen, it's, there wasn't any gaslighting. Most of what I've seen is like very autistic typology people that are just like trauma dumping and being like, and this was wrong and I, this, and I want this and blah, blah, blah. They're just telling everything. And then the doctor is negligent in addressing any of those issues and just saying like, oh, well, that's great. You're so self-aware. So I actually see the opposite. People will say, you're so self-aware. You're so articulate. You obviously are reasonable and you can really consent to this. And so I could see why someone like that type of person would be like, oh man, like I said all this and I didn't stop it. But the truth is that with any relationship that has a power dynamic, whether it be with a child and a parent or an employer, an employee, or a patient and a doctor, the person in authority is in charge of making sure that the boundaries are kept within the ethical framework because it's not the client's or patient's job to teach the doctor about what's right and wrong, about what's medically ethical or unethical, or about what the best treatment is for them. They're going to an expert because they don't know what the best treatment is for them and they want to learn more and understand themselves. And so I would just encourage people to to kind of to think about it in that kind of way that, you know, this it transcends far beyond the individual relationship you had with a professional and extends to a, a huge scope of international, you know, guidelines and precedents that have been set for professionals in medical and psychological literature for decades and decades. And so it's not your personalized fault. Um, and obviously, if they're if they're in the more rare case where there may have been some type of, you know, legitimate intentional lying, I think that's another thing to grapple with. And you know that accepting the shame in the short term is going to help you process the grief in the long term. So don't run away from the shame. Well done. Thank you, Laura. I, I'd like to add a little bit and then Forrest and then Carrie, we all want to come in on this one. I, I, I feel very strongly, I'm a psychotherapist and you know, people, clients lie to me all the time and they tell me this and they tell me that. And it's my job to hold the space, you know, neutral space and just listen along, roll with it because we're going through a process. So, you know, if you have lied, yeah, yeah, yeah. So wash, you know what I mean? That That's not really anything surprising for anybody who works in mental health. Almost surprising if you didn't would be how far I'd go there. That's number one. And number two, when you have been the target of a medical scandal and, you know, a target of malpractice, make sure that you don't add to the hurt that's been done to you by by beating yourself up. Get the right, you know, villain in your sights. And that's people who have been on huge salaries, huge position, positions of responsibility. And like Laura said so well, you know, who who put out false guidelines, false recommendations, knew they were doing harm, dismissed the harm that they were doing. Make sure they are in your sights as the people who really, really caused harm. Not you, not, not the person who's distressed and vulnerable and making up stories and thinking this is my way and I have to convince them. You've got the wrong villain in your sights if you're putting yourself into the into the boxing wing there. Do you want to say something first and then I'll invite Carrie in? Yeah, because that's, I mean, that's what a mentally ill person does. Yeah. And and it, it really is the job of a, of a psychologist to be able to diagnose. It's kind of like the oldest, the oldest case in the book is you're dealing with a mentally ill person and so you can't trust what they say. I've seen it. I mean, I, I'm partially guilty of that. And, and there's also kind of a known thing that you'll see even people who are still identifying as transgender. I think I read it in real defining in, in redefining realness. You see this theme of manipulating therapists to get the hormones, making them think that I'm really transgender. It's not a fetish or X, Y, Z. Um, and it, it was interesting for me um, to look at my medical record. And maybe that, you know, for me, that was a part of the whole process that I went through. I read all of the notes taken by psychologists and therapists. Some of them were really interesting. Um, I saw one psych who I saw before I was transgender. I was diagnosed with bipolar 
diagnosis, and that was me manipulating the doctor to get a bipolar diagnosis to get out of a, a like substance abuse counseling when I was in university. And so I manipulated the psychologist to get that letter that I was not abusing substances, that I had a neurodivergent condition. And as soon as I dropped out of therapy, he wrote on his he wrote in his notes that he realized that I had manipulated him. And and I compare that to the gender affirming therapists that I had who were they were not qualified for their job. And so you're looking at a systematic issue where you have really I, I remember seeing one very young woman who is just out of college. I was not going to talk to her about my porn problem, about cross-dressing at the age of 12. And at the same time, she was like enamored with me. And she was, I, I remember her telling me at one point how smart I was, that I was smarter than her professors. It was a really bizarre dynamic. Um, and she wrote me a couple letters. And when I looked back on that, uh, the issue that I that I saw was like she she was literally not qualified. So she took those letters and gave her to her higher up, and then got rubber stamped. Um, I just, yeah, I, I would say it's it's not the fault of of the the patient because and that's what this really is is and that's what the older literature you look at it you look at um, the the works of like Ray Blanchard and Stephen Levine they're dealing with people and they're especially with men they're dealing with with um, people who are lying about their identity and making up stories so that they can get these treatments. And that's the job of the clinician to start through this. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 I'm just saying I sympathize with it, not to blame yourself. It's the system. One of the first things I did when I detransitioned is I said, I need to find, like, I want to find somebody that looks like Freud. You know, I want to find somebody legit. So I, I found a forensic psychologist. I looked it up. I was like, I want to find a psychologist that is trained to spot liars. Uh, I want to find somebody who will call me on my BS. And I found somebody who had like 11 years of experience with minor sexual offenders. I realized that at the core, what I was doing was offensive. It was like a, it was a sexual thing and it was offensive. So I, I, I found somebody who I could, um, yeah, at that point, I was no longer manipulating my therapist. I, I wanted to, to work through and heal it. But I, I just, I completely sympathize with that. So I, I would just say, you're not alone. In fact, I think anybody who's trying to get cross-sex hormones is in a position where it's in the, it's their, it's their incentive to manipulate a therapist and convincing them that they're actually a true transgender and they really need these. Yeah, you're so right. And, you know, like we're coming up towards the end. I want to hear what Carrie has to say about it and then maybe invite each person to say something about the Dolby Path Files or Detrans Awareness Day. But I do think that when you're manipulating your therapist, you're kidding yourself. You, you know, you are fundamentally kidding yourself and you're manipulating your therapist. There's two things going on there. You're, you know, you're 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 in the middle of a mental health kind of maelstrom. Harry, would you like to speak? And then we'll uh, maybe everybody have their last. Yeah, time. I think. Yeah, we're, we're. I know it's been a long day for everyone. Um, I yeah, I I just you guys said it so well, and and you know I talk about the opioid crisis. It's one of the elements of a scandal where there's just people, you know, writing prescriptions, looking the other way, whether they're doing out of kindness or they don't want to ruffle feathers or the regulation monstrosities too much for them to go up against. Um, or there's, as I've talked about, there's a lot of people with prescription writing authority now that don't have a deeper, deep education um, that you get through years of medical school. And I think that is also part of the scandal that isn't often talked about. So I think for us for mentioning that, but um, it's just, it's just one of the hallmarks and it's a time where the people who are saying, no, I'm not going to do this are the ones that are the heretics and that's another sign that we're in the scandal because um the people just going along you know uh are are part of the problem and part of why you guys you know got hurt and others are getting hurt which we are really trying to stop so yeah, yeah. uh so you take it away Stella. we'll Hi, you, I, you know it's it's great to see we had up to 800 people in on the on the live stream wow. and Twitter. yeah and then uh, the YouTube and the webinar. So it's, it's been very good figures tonight. I didn't expect so many 
because you know the big event was last week and then D Trans Awareness Day has swept the boards today and I think it's going to be huge next week. So um, maybe um, each of you would like to say something. Abel, would you like to say something? <laughs> I think Abel is at this. <laughs> I think we bored you, Abel. Calling Abel. <laughs> but anyway, I think we need to be very forgiving of the fact that it's been a long day, you know? <laughs> Laura, will you, will you speak up? <laughs> he's, Abel's been just... He's been oh. going. He he does a lot, and he's a very helpful person. So he might look incompetent and like a slacker right now, but it's only because he was working so hard. Um, because yeah. I worked him hard at the AP. He's still <laughs> tired. Still, yeah, it's like six months later. Right. <laughs> it's a problem six months later, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, when we when we call it quits, anything last you want to say, Mia or Forrest, before we finish? I can go. Um, so, well, first, thank you to Forrest, Nora, and Abel, who's having a snooze. Um, For him. My, all I really want to say is to, to every detransitioner that it is absolutely not your fault. You are not in any way to blame at all, and I don't care if you were a child, an adolescent, um, an adult of any age. It is not your fault. You were failed by... A medical world gone mad that's lost its ethical compass and and by WPATH, the, the, the organization that politicized this field of medicine, removed all the gatekeeping, went with this totally reckless medical experiment, and yeah, you're you're just you're not to blame. Don't blame yourself. Couldn't agree more. Good for you. Third right. Boris, would you like to say anything Finn? Uh, we'd love to have you back in fairness like you, you've all been so insightful and you've added so much and so many thought-provoking points so anything you'd like uh, to say to finish off with? I would just say you can find me on Substack I, I, I have a lot of writing on there so oh good I'm gonna look you up Substack's yeah. where it's at yeah, it's what, called, what, what is your what is your Substack? Through the Trees okay. what? Through okay. the Trees Through the Trees Through the Trees and it's really 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 good um and Excellent. I'm a fan, and I'm so happy that Forrest is like able and willing to, you know, come and talk more about about things. So yeah, so many points to make, so many points. I sometimes think we're only, even though I've talked gender to death over the years, feel still feels there's an awful lot more to say. There's an awful lot more complexity around it. Um, a reminder for anybody who's interested in coming to Lisbon. I know Laura will be speaking at Lisbon, and Mia and Carrie. So maybe Forrest and Abel might join us in Lisbon in Portugal. This is the end of uh, September. Might have a massively, for me, incredibly exciting as a uh, new speaker, but I haven't got it quite nailed down, but I'm very excited about that. So I'll uh, keep your eyes peeled. Um, we'll close it up now. And thank you very much, everybody. Sorry we didn't get to all the questions. We did get to a good few of them. And um, see you next week. Another webinar. It's going to be very exciting. Do you want to say anything about that, Carrie? Oh, just can... just quickly. Yeah. So next week we're going to have a panel of uh, physicians. Um, so uh, you know that that should be really great, really great too. And then the week after that we're going to have uh, like writers and reporters and 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 things on it. And and we can think of more to do. But yes. So we'll we'll send out a notice for next week. We'll hopefully bring Camille because I know she was to come along. Yes. Just been yes. We'll, we'll bring others back in the future. Thank you all very, very much. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.